Shalom, we are live. My name is Dr. Tova Goldfein, and this is TMS Roundtable Global because we have a TMS Roundtable Israel, and maybe we'll have it in other countries. But right now, Rose and I are covering the globe. We have decided to go on at different times in the day and night throughout the world so we can reach more people in Australia and New Zealand and India and China, and we can come on at more appropriate times in America, East Coast, West Coast, because there's so much wonderful information that Rose and I have been privileged to gather and be part of meeting with all the different guests. So as we continue TMS Roundtable Global in the next few months, we'll be going live different times and days, usually Monday, but different times, always sometimes the next morning for Rose, who's in Melbourne, Australia, and now I will introduce my co-host and wonderful friend, Rose Hoy. It's evening for you and midday for me. <laughs> That's right. Welcome, everyone, to TMS Roundtable. Um, I'm an ISTDP psychotherapist, and today we thought we'd just talk about those numbers of people that don't get better and what happens to them because many of our guests will tell us how wonderful it is that so many people have got better, but they forget that, you know, 60% got better. Well, what happened to the 40%, you know, and all these months? How many, how many guests do you think we've had, Tova? Um, well, 100, 120? No, more, yeah, we've had, no, we've had, if, if see, this, it, Mirav counts, and if, She's on number 76, and we came on six months before her. So that's six times four is 24 shows. So at least, at least, oh, uh, at least uh, close to 100. Oh, it's got to be 100 plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But <laughs> the reason I bring that up is all these people have given us good advice and various advice and various methods to get better. But there's a whole bunch of people that are still grieving that they haven't got better. And I want to talk a little bit about that today. Rather than have a guest in, I thought if we've got any questions or any um, um, interaction, that would be good because then we can actually get a little bit more direct with people in a way that we can't with the guests. Now, our guests have been therapists, um, uh, Michael Galinsky, the filmmaker, the other filmmakers. Yeah. We've had a number of guests that give us a background idea of how it all works. We've also had many therapists on board and we've had quite a few people who have got better. Amazing. And they, of course, then want to help other people get better. But I don't know that it always sort of quite works out like that. And what I wanted to talk about And one tonight, of the biggest biggest questions we get from our clients is, well, how come they got better and I didn't? And it's, it yeah. pains us because you can get better. We are very individual. And I think that's why you're, you're talking today about this. We're so individual. And maybe there's something particular that will spark you that we can help you with. Because we feel that healing is always possible. It's always sure. possible and probable and probable. Sure. The thing is that if we're not feeling safe, we're not going to get better. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. The idea that your life is never safe. You're never able to rest in bed at night mm -hmm. and know that you're secure. Mm -hmm. And it sounds very, very frightening, but in a way, it's a reminder that you've been set up in that manner to always be alert, always be on alert, always being careful. So I wanted to actually so so on. so just to just to interrupt, which I do, and to make it more clear. So if somebody's in pain, they're not feeling safe, and there's reasons, deep seated reasons, because exactly. we know the pain is not physical. exactly Tova. Deep seated Continue. reason why they're not feeling safe, Continue. and the pain is adding to the to the to the trauma. Really, I suppose, you know. I'm not safe even before. You know, I was always careful with my family. I was always careful with my spouse, um, careful with my work situation. I don't like conflict, so I'd agree with people even if I didn't agree with them. 
What else? There's lots and lots of, they're called defences mm -hmm. and they're to keep you safe. But unfortunately, the body's on high alert and it can't let go. It's like being on the starting blocks at the Olympic Games and you're there on the starting blocks, but the gun never goes off, you know, the starting pistol. So you're there and all no. the muscles are all tense and they're ready to go in case a, a, a problem arose. And you could say the same with the stomach, with the gastrointestinal tract. Track. You could also say that that anxiety in you, in that area, is always ready to go, to defend you maybe, or, or to um, have that feeling that, you know, something is nauseous in my life. Mm -hmm. but I can't figure out what it is. And the other anxiety pathway is a cognitive perceptual disruption where you can't think clearly. Right. And those things right. sit in front right. of your recovery. Do you know there's something, the fibromyalgia group, they call their, they call it fibro frog as if, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, so yeah. that's affecting there. And, and also yeah. it, 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 with autoimmune disease, we have found that, the immune system will weaken because of that repression of those feelings and that of the threat. Feelings. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So when, when we look at the whole, how to put it, the whole picture, something comes up, something in our lives come up, for example, a divorce, a death, um, a child leaving home, multiple things. And the tension is in the body so strongly that it can't be let go of because of the fear, the fear that something will, will go wrong. So if we open that whole idea up and see, now what I've done is I, I could actually talk about anxiety manifestations. Maybe I'll start there. You know, I've got a list of them here for us. These are anxiety manifestations of the striated muscle, muscle tension, tight stomach, chest pain, aches and pains, increased heart rate, sighing, sweating, difficulty breathing, diffic disrupted sleep, shakiness, exhaustion, blushing, yes. hot flashes and chills, pins and needles. Would that be, would that be migraines? Because Scott's visiting us. So glad to see yeah, you, Scott, no, from you, England. But that, more smooth muscle. Okay, so that's something else, but. Yeah, that's the striated listen. muscle. That's that muscle, those muscles that are ready to, you know, to defend. Right. Smooth muscle, that's the GI tract headache, diarrhea, constipation, nausea, rashes, dry throat, a choking sensation, difficulty swallowing, impotence, vaginal pain, pressure on the eyes, irritable bowel, gas pain, frequent urination, cold hands and fingers, butterflies in the stomach. That's all smooth muscle. Okay. Okay, but then we've got co cognitive disruption. And that is dizziness, difficulty thinking, loss of reality testing, impulse discharge urge, you know, like you want to do something now without thinking, losing track of thoughts, losing concentration, blanking out, amnesia, fragmentation of self. Uh, all of these are anxiety manifestations. And the reason we have them is because it's, triggered by unconscious feelings, feelings that haven't reached our conscious awareness. Anxiety is triggered from something going on within us. It's different from fear in that fear is triggered by an external threat. So the anxiety in us is something like the, the butterflies in the stomach. So if you see that as being quite pervasive and it grabs us, so what we have to do to survive that is build defences. Now, I've made a list of the defences here Excellent. so that we can see them. Good. These are common defences. Now, verbal, we've got them, I've got them down as verbal, nonverbal, repressive, and um, in that way you can sort of see verbal would be vagueness, speaking in generalities, you know, not being explicit contradictory statements you know someone says one thing and then they say the, mm -hmm. the opposite the mm -hmm. next time sarcasm and irony mm -hmm. changing the subject have you ever noticed that you ask someone about something personal something that's important to them and they'll move over 
and tell you about their neighbor or their friend. So or these are neighbor. examples of defense me mechanisms that are we're using to cover our anxiety. Anxiety, exactly, exactly. That's why if I can gather it all together, and then I want to sort of draw why that would be happening mm -hmm. and how we can actually have a little, a little sort of pinpoint right. in why this insecurity comes up. So I want to just yeah. say to the audience, because we have some new listeners, that and what we're saying is that if we could become aware of these defense mechanisms or we recognize them or we notice them or witness yeah. them, this, this is a sign that will help us because if we notice this, the pain won't have to come. Like as Sarno says, the pain is distracting us from these feelings. So we say, well, how do I know these feelings? By understanding our defenses or like, yeah, to protect course, if I have a headache, I have a headache. But if I understand the, how my be, I'm behaving or my verbal defenses, it might help me um, be calmer around. So continue. I'm, I want to just explain yeah, because it's, you're putting perfect. very good things into pieces yeah. um, and then letting, helping us, giving us tools to help ourselves. Sure. But before we get the tools to help ourselves, we've actually got to see the big picture. We've got to be a drone and watch it. Mm -hmm. I'm they, Because you can't recognize the anxiety because it comes up as sweatiness or something like that. So you look at yourself and you say, I'm all hot and sweaty. You know, what's the matter with me? And then as someone's speaking to you and you, you feel as though they're judging you, for example, right. it might be that you come up with something sarcastic to say back to them. That's your defense because this sweatiness or whatever is coming over you and you can't control that. So you can actually say something or do something as a defense so you can push that person back. So and that I want to just say, even when I interrupt sometimes or talk fast, it's coming. Rose has helped me. It's, it's, it's normal. It's human. Everyone does it. But it's kind of a little bit of a sign of but you're anxious. I'm anxious, but the anxiety is not at a level where it's hurting me. And I'm aware. So it's something I can observe and be mindful of. Exactly. And when you observe it and are mindful of it, you know that there's some sort of fear going on, some sort of internal fear that this person or this activity or this place that I'm in is a worry, is a worry, and I've got to be alert and I've got to be careful. So all of these mechanisms are to protect the organism. They're to protect the person. Now I've got, okay, so I've got verbal, I've got vagueness, speaking in generalities, contradictory statements, sarcasm and irony, changing the subject, argumentativeness, dismissing and blaming. You know, think of that all the times that people say, you know, my partner did this and I was so annoyed, you know, but yet the, the person saying it didn't do anything about it, but they can blame the other person. And that's to shift the blame onto someone else because it's too painful within us. So if you can see all those little mechanisms, they're, they're wonderful mechanisms and they've kept us safe as a kid. Uh, what have, okay, weepiness and crying, acting out, voice and tonality, speed of speech, withdrawal and detachment, and also appearance. A lot of people will look bedraggled or whatever and just to, so that they won't be noticed. Even body language, we can, know, we can know our own body language. Exactly, yes, exactly. Now, there's repressive defences as well. Now, these are um, there very strongly when, especially in therapy, because, you know, you go to therapy wanting to have help, but then at the same time, you don't really want help. And that therapist also reminds us of a caregiver, maybe, or whatever. So I've got a list here, intellectualizing, mm -hmm. rationalizing, worrying, ruminating, minimizing, uh, reaction formation, you know, like reacting instead of responding, mm -hmm. ignoring, avoidance, procrastination. That's a very favorite one. Why make a decision when I can put, put it off? Procrastinate. Yes. Yes. Is I'll do like, that later. Is taking a mountain out of a molehill and maybe to the extreme, somebody who becomes OCD, but you don't have to if you become aware of it before it becomes OCD. Yeah, We're all, right. We all have OCD. It's a common yeah, exactly. human quality. Okay. 
one of the very important ones in this area is self self attacking thoughts it's probably self criticism it's huge and it's huge in this area and if you think about people with somatic pain you know you have this idea that perfectionism is important but in actual fact the perfectionism is driven from the self criticism and then there's a certain area of That's of true. of thought that it doesn't matter i don't personally matter as long as i look good with other people so it's a whole there's a whole range of things and the reason i'm bringing this up is so that the people who didn't instantly get better which are few and far between in actual fact um can see that it's a process tova often says remember it's a lifelong process but the first part of that process is to see it like a drone you're seeing it down below and you're seeing how you react instead of um interact right very good or respond Excellent. yeah now what else have i got projection denial acting out uh compulsive behavior um another important one is identifying with the aggressor identifying with the person who isn't very nice to you hmm. and making excuses for them ah and i suppose the other way could be that i'm not very nice to people and then i project that onto them mm -hmm. as though they're not very nice to me or if there's a quality in someone i don't like like i have that quality and i have to be aware that i'm judging them yeah. and then i'm judging myself yeah well you're judging them to save yourself because you're aware of that quality in you but you push it aside you push it away and these are all because defense you... mechanisms to defend yes. my feelings and to push down my feelings yes exactly exactly and the other thing is um uh passive aggressive behavior you know you smile at someone but you sort of um do the opposite you know so you know how to deal with defenses the first step is to become aware of the defenses as i say like a drone and that you rely on them to save yourself from your feelings you know people say but i can't feel anything i've got no idea you know i've got all this information that says i should be able to feel my feelings well you can't mm -hmm. because they're so pushed down mm -hmm. and all of this work all this bulk is there to put a wall between you and your feelings and feeling. do you know what i hear rose i don't want to be vulnerable i don't like to be vulnerable it's weak i don't want to go there i want to do it without doing that i can just get there without being vulnerable and i think we think vulnerability is bad or weak and it becomes this repressed feelings and turns into a tumor god forbid that's what we're saying and we're not talking about being extreme vulnerability we're talking about being balanced and just acknowledging in fact if we just recognize like what you taught me rose and accept our feelings that's part of the healing to just accept Please, even if yeah. i hate i was speaking to a patient last night i don't like my pain i said you don't have to like it but you have to accept the part of you that doesn't like your pain because there's a conflict in your body and in some level your body needs to feel that safety but also see that in a different light as well they don't like their pain but they actually don't like themselves that's it and you see the pain is telling them to stop it stop 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 right. you're doing yourself harm very good so when you don't like yourself you're just going to have pain and could we draw that back to agreeing with people you know i don't like conflict so i'll agree with people people pleasing yeah. people pleasing yeah. exactly yeah. yeah so when we clarify the function of the defenses both po positive and negative defenses because remember all of these defenses are worthwhile but it's overusing them that the problem arises we then need to see what we can do about it as we recognize it maybe sarcasm someone says oh i know someone says oh you look good today and the person says back oh yes i um i i i um well, apologizes for something well you know it's just accepting what the other person has said not putting yourself down you know do you know what i mean yeah so yeah good, good so, analogy 
Yeah. So what I've done is I've got a because I bring it up the, the diagram. Background. Yes, please bring it up. If it's you know what I'll go down and you explain it so it'll be a little bigger. Oh yeah. Okay. Or actually get rid of me as well. Because I can just talk it. I can just speak it. Can you hear me, Tova? Audience oh, won't like hear you. If I take down. No. Yeah. Take both of us down. The so audience won't like hear you then. Oh, okay. Radio. Okay. All right. Well, you hop down and I'll speak it. Okay. What I've done is I've got a drawing from Circle of Security and it's about being with. Remember that word, being with a secure adult. And this is a reflection from our childhood. So just as you see this circle, see what you can put in it. Now, I've got it listed down here because it's a bit hard for me to read here. Now, in your experience, oh, that's even better. Thanks, Tova. Okay. In your experience. Say something. As a I want to child, say one thing. How much was Rose, your. Rose, I just want to say one thing. We can uh -huh. send this out yeah. on our page if people want to have a, a copy of it when you're done if they want to review it we can send it out if they're interested they that'd can be let us know. yeah yeah that would be great actually tova that would be fabulous okay so this is from circle of security and this is um helping parents to actually feel allow their children to feel secure and for them to notice when they are overprotective or underprotective or abusive or aggressive or whatever so in your experience as a child, how much would your caregiver able to be with you? See, being with you. And help you organize these six key feelings. Okay. In the bottom there, we've got curiosity. Were your, was your caregiver able to actually allow you to check things out without warning you of the danger? Was your caregiver able to allow you to walk across the, 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 the brick wall, for example, and just remind you that it's okay, you're safe, I'm here with you? Or when you were curious, for example, did they say, be careful, you're, you're going to get hurt? You see, hopefully you can see there's a difference. Okay, so if you look at that circle and see if you could put that in the circle or outside the circle or maybe a little bit in between. So. The next one is joy. Okay, happiness of a little kid. You know, he's five years old and he's just got his new train set and he's sitting there playing with the train set and someone bigger, maybe an older kid or something, says to them, leave that alone, it's mine. And nobody came to actually protect you within that situation. Can you see where I'm coming from? The whole idea is, that the child is got this happiness and this joy, but the caregiver didn't mirror it back to the child. Now, this may seem as though it's sort of way out of left field, but all of this continues to happen in us in an adult way, and that's why I'm bringing it out. The next one is sadness. You know, granny dies, and you're all sad, and then mummy, granny, mummy says to you, no, don't, don't cry. Nanny's at peace now or whatever. Instead of allowing the child to allow the sadness to come up or someone's taken the child's toy and they tell the child, okay, you've got to share. Well, you know, if you're under six or something, you've got no idea about sharing. So something is not is missing in the relationship of that adult being with you. What's the next one? Fear. Okay. This is a very important one, really, because lots of children are afraid of the dark, afraid of rain, afraid of going to school. And when the adult encourages them and says, I'm with you, I'll walk you to school or I'll kiss you bye bye or whatever it is to reassure the child so the fear is manageable. Remember, fear is an important experience in us but it's manageable. When we know we need to cross the road, we know we've got to be careful. But when we've got fear of rain or fear of school or fear of whatever, when it's in us, this fear all the time, and it's often described as butterflies, pain in the tummy, 
with children. And that's the, that's the fear. Now, take that fear at the moment and see it in your adult life as well, that those same symptoms are happening as an adult. Now, the next one I've got is anger. Now, anger is a very important one as well. Because if you see a little child that's not being um, acknowledged, you know, they want that ice cream and they're going to have it and they're going to throw a tantrum. But nobody's recognised that the child's overtired or the child's hungry, but the child gets into trouble for the tantrum rather than what's going on at the back in the background. And this can come up as the parent is tired. That's the other thing. So just be aware of that. That's that angry feeling that's in us. Now, the other thing that hasn't been included in this, and it's an adult relationship that we need to talk about, is that when we're angry with people we love, we're guilty. So when mummy doesn't give me the ice cream and I want to hit her, I'm guilty because I love her. So I can't join my angry feelings and my loving feelings comfortably. I have to keep them at arm's length. So what comes up? Pain, suffering in some sort of way. Now, the other thing is shame. You know, think of the five-year-old and he's got a glass of milk, but the glass is too big for his little hand and he slips and the glass breaks on the floor. So mama comes along and tells him off for the glass falling. But mama doesn't think that the glass was too big for the child. You know, the little hand couldn't reach around. So the child has shame. Now, all of this sits in us forever until it's opened up and exposed. And if you think about it, somatic pain, suffering remains in us. So the reason I'm explaining all this is to see that this sits in us and stops that feeling of safety in our lives. I think, Toby, you put all those things in there. Oh, that is so lovely. Yes, Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Because all of this actually then sits in us, sits in our gut, sits in our muscle, and we can't let it go. Yeah. So. And, and, the and then reason- what happens, let's just say, and say so what happened when I was a kid? I'm not spilling milk now, but what happens is the experience of the milk and how I felt, we begin to repeat the patterns Yes. Um, and develop over, relationships over, over, over. that are kind of like a similar pattern. And when we recognize those patterns that I, you know, I go and I meet someone new and I feel scared. I feel like I'm going to be yelled at. I feel like I'm going to be so, right, criticized. criticized. Yeah. So and this person's just being the person. So I'm already projecting. And so yeah. I start to notice the patterns and I can just be aware. And that's when the healing happens. And this Again, sounds like a lot of um, amazing intellectual understanding of feelings, but we have to know our feelings to get to them. So we, we're, we're intellectualizing them and teaching you and sharing with you. And, and then it becomes a habit. You begin to know what you're feeling, when you're feeling. Your body hives tell you uh, your body situation, your yeah. itchiness, your yeah. eyes blinking, your dry mouth your palpitations, my talking fast will keep telling me, hmm, I wonder what's going on. Exactly. Now, again, can we loop back to those people? We've got 100% of people and only 60% of them get better. And, you know, like all the therapists and all the, what would you call it, the experts, sort of tell us and the coaches and the coaches and the coaches the life coaches are giving us information what do we do with this information how do we apply it in in our life well what i'm saying is that if we see that these are our impediments to getting better and that we didn't have a miracle cure but we've got all this baggage and i could go into attachment and i could say how like even in therapy you can tell when the when the when the um, when the rupture of the relationship has happened, you know, if it's pre-verbal, then people can't actually speak it, and they can get a tightness in their throat. So all of that can add up, but it's not necessary to talk about that per se. What's more important to talk about is the fact that 
if you didn't get better with the coaching, if you didn't get better with the all this other therapy stuff that's out there, that it's there's a reason and it's not that you're hopeless. Right. It's that you've got this baggage and you haven't actually been able to notice the baggage. And that's why I pointed out. Now, the other thing to do is to also notice that often with somatic pain, it's a handy thing to have. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's a protective mechanism. Often it's when mother or father were kind to you that allowed you to stay in bed, that left you stay at home from school, and there could have been a bully at school. If I've got a tummy pain, I'll be taken to the doctor and I won't have to face that bully. So there's often a reason why we've got somatic pain. Can you so give us another example actually... of a, how pain can, and disease can be our friend and we're... Yeah. 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 So I've made a little list. And the first little list is being aware if you don't feel safe. You don't feel safe. One this down. One. You're not really going to be able to reach out. And the other thing is that you need to actually be aware that it's your will to change. It's your absolute desire. You have to turn against your defences. You have to notice them. Notice that your, your back pain or your stomach ache is there as a defence against emotional closeness somewhere and observe it so you can turn against it. And it's not easy. And I, I want you to know, say that I, again, please. That's very important. Our pain is there. But we've got to turn against the pain. We've got to actually be the be the drone. And, you know, I often think if you've ever been on a big ship and the ship has to turn around in the harbour and you can hear the screws going underneath and you've actually got to turn your whole thought pattern around to, to actually look at your feelings, your emotions, when the pain comes up or if the pain's constantly there you've just got to see it that it's there but i can actually see it that this pain is not me it's something that's on me so that will that desire to push through is so important and you know it doesn't mean it's going to happen in 24 hours like these miracles that we see but it does happen and it may take a year it may take a year and a half and it's a gradual thing, little by little by little, as you observe it, as you observe that when something happens within your family, mm -hmm. that the pain is worse or that it will have a spike. And if you start noticing that that spike actually happens at a certain time when I've judged myself or I've judged someone else or I felt, well, how would you put it, Tova, that you've, you've, um, I could have done better. Right. You know, why didn't I? Why couldn't right. I? I could have. Right. Yeah. Right. So. And, and I would love to, ad to address um, the, the, the insight that we want the pain to be gone. We have, we have a, an expectation and we have an outcome. I want it to be gone and I'm, I will not stop until it's gone. As a, and can you address how that being in the process of that increases the gone is much more healthy and will get you closer than not giving yourself a choice. The pain's got to be gone. That's it. Like there's some conflict there again, that the bot, the brain is going to perceive fight and flight and not give up. Can you address exactly. that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you see, the more you want it to stop, the more it's going to be there. And that's another another impediment to getting better because it's a bit about being um it's about seeing the grief that the pain has caused you and actually i always like to change the word pain to suffering good I because like the pain as people call it is different to actually when you cut your arm or something it's a different feeling and if you can call that suffering that my heart is suffering because it's not about the actual physical manifestations, it's about your heart suffering. And if you see it like that, you can then make the link to whether mum or dad were kind to you or whether that safety circle actually happened for you or not. 
and how many of those are, things can you put within that circle and see what the ones that you couldn't put in and see how that insecurity comes up in us. But, you know, we can have um, a great relationship with our family. We can be really great at work, but a certain area can actually fall down. You know, often you find that high achieving people, they're really great at work and they can keep the, ba the pain at bay and they come home and they've got to lie down straight away. But no one at work would even know that they have this problem. Interesting. So, yeah. so that's a good one. Change that, the word um, pain to suffering and notice yeah, that your heart's yeah. suffering. Yeah, heart suffering. And can you talk a little bit or two about the compassion when you notice your heart is suffering, how the compassion is exactly. the mechanism for the brain to calm down? That's right. As if you, you know, if you think about it, if you saw someone else suffering like that, you'd put your arms around them and you'd hold them safely. Yeah. So in actual fact, if you can do that to yourself, remember it's not easy, only a tiny little smidgen. Like I say to people, breathe, 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 mm -hmm. just so that they can get that tiny bit of space to actually get the and idea. He, here, here's, an, here's, a, here's a little bit of a, of a, you know, a point about a therapeutic relationship. When you're in a relationship with a friend, we know that with the spouse, with the teacher, with the therapist, you have that opportunity to feel that safety, to feel that. No, not necessarily, Tova. You see, that's it. But, but, because but. Because it's in but, the background. Right. But then if you get to practice that safety experience and feel calm, and here I am giving you compassion, and then I go home and I create that experience. That's what that's my point I'm making. Here's an opportunity many times if you can create that and see the difference that I'm not doing it with myself. I'm not nice to myself, but look how kind it is for me. Look how calm I am in this therapeutic process. Look how safe my body feels. I'm not in pain. But then when oh. I am, I'm beating myself up on the head. I'm not, so what I want to do is recreate that what I had with a therapist or what I had with that experience. That's that's the, right. But that's the calm part. But you come home and you've got conflict with your spouse, the pain's going to shoot up. So it's to notice that the pain shoots up when there's conflict. If you can do that, and often when there is conflict or something like that or something's going wrong, just breathing, mm -hmm. just breathing will actually mm -hmm. calm you enough mm -hmm. to be able to look. And is it true, Rose, that if there's pain, and it's chronic pain. It's there's that means there's conflict, and you're saying well, everything's fine. So there's you need to look at the conflict in your subconscious, and maybe something that you're not aware of. Well, you're not. Uh, look, no one. That's why I wanted to talk about this tonight, because no one is going to deliberately do this to themselves. No one. So this conflict has to be blocked down, has to be repressed. Yeah, so if we can actually draw or Neil, up. Neil said, or the fear of potential conflict. Yes. Exactly. Anticipating, anticipating, catastrophizing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And look, you know, I also want to actually, thanks, Neil. <laughs> I want to bring up another subject. Please. Within the subject. Tova, can you get that link? To that arm being smashed you know the the um you know it's on youtube are you able to reach it no i can't not unless i'm off the show but I, we can have another show because it's our round table we'll do it again <laughs> sure. so go ahead, but tell uh, us the story I, on youtube you can find oh dear oh dear it's amazing tell us about it uh it's a mirror thing you put you have the person put their hands on the table yeah Remember, we tried to get a lady to come and talk yeah, to us about to do that. Mirror therapy, and then, yeah. And then she um, she had something come up and yeah. she wasn't able to come on. So you've got both hands on the table. Yeah. And then you put a wall, a barrier here, so this hand can't see. And then the therapist puts a rubber hand here. Okay. So there's there's this is blocked. So this yeah. hand is blocked. Yeah. There's a pretend hand here, yeah. and it's here. Now, when you watch it on YouTube, you'll see that you just watch it. 
you will shudder when the hammer comes down on the rubber hand. It's oh, wow. So this and is supposed to make your hand, let's go ahead, tell us how it's supposed to happen. Yeah, because the, the, the left hand, for example, the hammer doesn't come down on that. It comes down on the rubber hand. But the left hand feels the pain. Reacts. Yes. But when you watch it, you find that you react and you're only watching it and uh -huh. it's not even your hand. Wow. So the point is? You anticipate that it's going yes. to be painful. Yes. You know it's a rubber hand. You're watching it. Yeah. And yet you know it's a rubber hand. And the brain goes into still... fight or flight. Yes. So you still react to yeah. someone's rubber hand wow. and you're only watching it. I'm going to make so a note. Imagine note what it's like for the page. person yeah. who gets the pain in their hand and it's a rubber hand that's been yeah. hit. So that's how the mind operates. It operates all the time. And that's why, thank you, Neil, for putting that up because it's the fear of potential or perceived suffering. threat. Like Alan Gordon talks about your, yeah. when we have pain and there's no reason our body's perceiving a threat. So we exactly. have to look at, and what Rose is sharing is the threat could be in the deep place of feelings that we begin to repeat these repression of feelings because of patterns from a child, from being yeah. a child. And okay. So yeah, I'm going to write that down. Okay, so was there any more points? I made three points on the the last one was change the word pain to suffering. Notice your heart is suffering. Yeah. To yeah, be uh, yeah. is there anything else like regarding points that well people... okay, the most important thing is capital L O V E. Oh no, not that word. <laughs> That's the best word of all. Oh capital I. What about that word? Okay, what we're looking for is allowing our loving feelings to actually be present with our angry feelings or our sad feelings. And that's why I drew that circle before, because those feelings need to be within that circle for us to be able to experience them fully. Yes. Now, could I just mention, Patrick, that positive affirmations are lovely, I am safe. But if you are a person with somatic pain, just notice how much you say to yourself, well, I'm not really. Like I say it up here, but not down here. Is that what you mean? Exactly. So Patrick, you're right. It's about but being totally honest with yourself. And Rose and I give lots of our clients a book called The Lies We Tell Ourselves, which is not, <laughs> we all do it. We're not wrong or right. It's just the pattern of it's a defense. So sure. the affirmation so is a wonderful tool if you're really going to own it and believe it. And I even say, put it in your journal, write it 10 times, write it on the mirror, say it in the no. mirror. Okay. Write on the mirror the times you say I'm not really. Because really, I, I mean, I've been doing this for a long, long, long time. And the thing is that most people with an affirmation, unless they're saying it in their sleep or something like that, when, they're, when their punitive superego isn't operating, will um, not believe it. That's the, you can say it, but are you going to believe it? That's interesting. Yeah. It's like, rather, so you're not, you're I'm not even that you're lying to yourself. You don't trust yourself. Exactly. And go back to our circle of security before how we prove to ourselves that we're not even trustworthy because nobody could support us in our big feelings, in our big, strong feelings. Wow. There was no big, strong person to support those big, strong feelings. And Rose, are you saying now that it's in a way we have to reparent ourselves with these insights and yes. um, love? Yes. And we don't so much reparent ourselves, but what we do is we reassure ourselves that we're adults because this behaviour that comes into our system isn't necessary anymore. And that's why we need that drone part of us to see how we act. And then the other part of that is to have empathy for ourselves. And the next step is to actually be aware that we're adults and that we don't need to worry in that same way. But it takes a little bit of effort to do that. And that's why I always bring in the will. It has to be your will to do this work. 
for example, if someone comes to me for therapy, I'll usually ask them, who sent you? And if they say, oh, my husband <laughs> or my wife, I say, well, I can't help them. So what help do you want? Because it's not their will to get better. Often people with somatic pain will actually, their family members will be advising them over and over again of what, what they could do to get better. And then they go on that advice instead of actually drawing on their own needs and their own desire. Yeah. So because you see you've got that conflict because the somatic pain, the suffering has been yeah. that sort of victim yeah. feeling. And what, what you share today, person. which people can watch on a YouTube and repeat, and Rose has shared a lot of information about her work on the, the page, is that when we know ourselves, that is... A that is a key to getting better. And you're like, what does knowing myself have to do with my chronic pain? <clears throat> but Rose is making the connection. She's building the road between knowing yourself, <clears throat> understanding your patterns, not judging and yourself, feeling, not criticizing. To feel in your body. And feeling your body, feeling, you know, the path from the head to the heart, which we're talking about. This is, <clears throat> this is your medicine. This is your... Again, you're the placebo, you're the medicine, you're the healing. The solution is inside of you. And we're sharing with you what it is and how to get there. Now you're saying, well, okay, doc. Yeah, I tried that, did that. Okay, stop, 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 stop. Write in capital letters on the side there, L-O-V-E. I wrote it again. I'm going to write it again, but I'll write it again. <laughs> did you write it again? I'll, I'll write it again. again. Oh, you did too. Thank you. Write it again. And again. It's coming up. <laughs> Good. Do it three times. Yeah, but love's not enough. What does love have to do with it, says Tina Turner? <laughs> Go ahead, Rose. It's, I'm playing devil's advocate idea with you. That we love our people. We love them, but they've hurt us. You know, you you loved your partner and he and he betrayed you. Or she betrayed you. But you love them. And how can I handle that anger and still love that person? My mother had mental health issues. What am I going to do? I love her, but she makes me so angry. How can I join them? So what we're doing is we're allowing the loving feelings, the sad feelings, all those feelings to be in us and be able to love those. So people. I think what Neil's saying is if I can love myself more than I my my sorrow about that person leaving me or i can love myself more than i loved who i was with that person i can heal that wound lovely beautifully said yes yes i can heal that wound myself yeah and you see if we see suffering as woundedness you know as, an, as a nurse i often think of when i see people with somatic pain i uh, i think of the deep wound of a, of a deep wound that's infected and we just have to open it up first to let the air in and clean it up bit by bit so the wound gets opened and it gets cleaned rather than close it over and say just get over it you know what i mean and i think so this is the scary little, black box little, this, this is the yeah. scary part that people talk about well i don't want to be vulnerable or i don't want to go there can you talk a little bit about that That's place exactly you don't right. want to go is the place you need to go and it's safe. Sometimes a therapist helps you go there together, but it That's is right. an uncomfortable new place to go into the wound. That's right. And that's why you need the will. You need that desire to push through. And, you know, if you think about it in another way, I don't know, but here in Australia when they play football, they run through this sort of barrier thing, you know, it's probably paper or something, but the team, the football team pushes through where you've got to go through that painful thing to get out the other side. Right. Yeah. And That's you've got what... to do it with full force. You've got to do it with, with, with that sense of that I am lovable and I'm capable. Yeah. I happen to think Alan Gordon's book should be called The Way Through, but it's called The Way Out. I think it's called the way through. Um, yeah. So belief, intention, and focus. And interesting that you say that, Neil, because I talk to some people here in Israel and they'll say, you know, 
believing is biological. We know that. We know it's chemical, but it's not so easy to believe. It's not like you have to believe. Okay, it's another uh, pathway, a neuro pathway. Like I'll give this example of when I took a course with Howard Schrubiner, the woman was in his room. He showed us a video and she had been abused by her husband and he broke the jaw. She wasn't, she wasn't with him anymore, but years and years later, she's still having jaw pain and she can't even open up a car window. She's in Chicago. She can't even open up a, a window, the wind. She can't even be, it gives her excruciating pain in the jaw. So Howard Schubert is doing his pain reprocessing technique and his a little bit of ISTDP, EAET, or think, I think calling it, and doing his magic. And he has her put an ice pack on her jaw and she doesn't feel um, pain. So what was I saying? Why did I bring that up? I don't know. I'm waiting anyway. to hear it. Anyway, oh, oh yeah, belief. So she had to experience this. It wasn't like, yeah, okay, you, you're telling me I should believe that I can be in cold. But now I, he's having her experience, a physical experience, uh, a, psych, a physiological experience that she can be with cold. So that's, so that's where movement therapy and yoga and Qigong and meditation can give us more of this. It can ground space. the belief. It can ground the belief in our body. So that's it can where, give us space to actually explore it. Yeah. If you see it more as a space thing, meditation, mindfulness, yes. all of those things give us a little window yeah. to get through. And you do have to sometimes fold into the pain, fold into the, the scary place. Um, you know, I call it walking into the lion's den with the toy lions. Um, anyway, so Neil says, if you believe at the beginning, then as the chain starts to happen, it will turn into certainty. In fact, we're going to have Neil on our show uh, in the summer. He's uh, gone through himself uh, an autoimmune disease. And he shared a story with us. So thank you for coming and meeting us, Neil. Now we're really meeting you. Cheryl's sharing, and Cheryl is uh, a, a client of ours and an amazing has an amazing healing story from any itis that you can name. Cheryl had it and is healing from it and living a quality life with all of her itises. Um, she's quite I'm amazing now. Yeah. Belief in yourself, will and intent without the pain body, you won't have the will and intent. So when suffering becomes, so the inner, when suffering becomes greater than the pain, then we can do the internal engineering, so to speak. We stop giving faith in the thoughts and draw belief and faith in ourselves. Lovely. That's beautiful. Okay, Cheryl. So amazing. But you had to work hard and do it and be very compassionate and trusting um, that your body wasn't attacking you, that it felt like an attack and how you could come to terms with that inner war inner conflict inside of you and you've did an amazing job and you're continuing to do an amazing job with your healing. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of anything else we wanted to talk about. The hour's almost up. Let's just run through. And um, Patrick, it's so nice to meet you. I haven't met you before, Patrick. <clears throat> and um, Neil, I think Neil, you're from the Midwest. Um, and Scott, I hope you're still there, Scott. From England, did you want to say anything? I know he sometimes chimes in between work, but um, Scott, did you want to ask uh, Rose anything or speak to us on the live? Um, <clears throat> let's just even chat about what a, a, what a constant headache would be. Uh, Neil's in London, so is Scott, in London. and somewhere in England. What would what would a migraine be? What would be? Why wouldn't a migraine go away? What would be the reason? For a constant head pain. person would turn in on themselves. Blame themselves. Mm -hmm. Feel like a victim. Right. Yeah. Right. And also, remember that there's another component to this that isn't really talked about, and it's more technical, and that some people are so highly resistant and other people are fragile. So there's a whole spectrum of people that are having pain. And sometimes the person who actually um, is uh, uh, highly defended will uh, will actually um, have a different set of pain to the person that's more fragile and more um, 
you, you know, feels it more personally, put it that way. Right. Whereas the defiant person might have a different sort of pain. Oh, can. You know, so mm -hmm. in therapy, you sort of have a look at how the person, if they go to anxiety or they go to defences at first. So when you're talking to them, you can actually see which is the, the pathway. And then you follow that pathway until they get out of it. So mm -hmm. it's a, sort of a long Wow. It's elongated, I suppose. And wow. Helping them to actually titrate mm -hmm. their anxiety mm -hmm. is one of the important things so that they can become aware that they're so, anxious when someone speaks to them directly. Like, mm -hmm. what are the feelings you'd like me to help you with? And people just go, shut down. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so and that's then, really, uh, again, let's yeah. continue. And they'll get anxious and they'll maybe get a sore throat or they dry in the mouth. Whereas other people will say, oh, no, I don't have any problems. And I'll say, well, why are you here with me then? Oh, oh well, you know, maybe I do. But they'll defend straight away. Right. right. Yeah. It's hard to it's hard to uncover or I call, you know, being naked with your clothes on. It's hard. It's not comfortable for us to do that. And yet oh, it's awful. It's free, it's horrible it's, but it is freeing. It will set you free to know yes, yourself. Exactly. This is why the brilliance of... Uh, John Fredrickson to write that book, The Lies We Tell Ourselves. It's a brilliant way to never be estranged again. And so let yeah, this actually, be. Actually, write, write it down yes. so that anyone who's interested in, in getting yes. it for themselves. The Lies. Because yeah, it's an absolutely amazing book. I Hard tell, to read in some places. I know. Well, it's time to have him back and about talking about this book. Just about this book. Yeah, he, John, and the F R E. Remember his name's got spelled a little bit F R E. Fredrickson. Fredrick. F R E D E R I C K S O N. That's his latest book. R I C K S O N. That's a different book, right? Yeah. Um, I'll put it up on the sh on the um page. Good, That's his good, name. Um, a good book okay. for therapists. Yeah, and again, nothing. We all do this. This is you know Michael Galinsky. <clears throat> talks about this condition that we all have called being human. <laughs> and um, it really is something that, you know, we're all going through this. I say it over and over again. Rose and I are also going through chronicity of one thing or another. And it's something that like we're able to, it's not hurting our life because we're, we're accepting we it. We can acknowledge it. Acknowledging acknowledging it. it. Yeah. That's the important thing. Yeah. Acknowledging it. Yeah. yeah, and also not having shame, because the shame is another terrible thing, right. because the shame criticizes us, puts us right. down, and we have this sort of false friend in our heads right. that tells us what we should be doing. Right. I mean, I love that German way of putting it, and um, yeah. Schadenfreunde. Yeah. You know, Which is, uh, sort of, yeah, you know, like the friend sort of that. Thing. Yeah, and again. That's us being honest with like, why did I bring this into my life? It must be something I need to learn from it. So uh, there's a, an, a paper that some colleagues of mine wrote about called The Wisdom of Experience. And it's all about that we created this experience for us to learn. And, oh, thanks. It, and it's really, really, it's hard to swallow that. But if you can see your pain as a message and as a place for you to learn from, which I mean, all the people that we've been interviewing in my other show about people who heal from cancer and MS, they had to look at their body and pain that way. They had to look at their disease that way in order to heal. And it's not, doesn't, doesn't sound correct, but that is the paradox of our journey. Right, yeah. exactly. So I am thrilled that Rose came up with this idea. I'm not the one with, only the one with good ideas. <laughs> An amazing idea, Rose, to come on the show and talk about our work. And I'm proposing that once a month we come and talk about our work, things that I do, some clients we've healed, some things that we've helped, because we're we're in practice and we're having an amazing opportunities, not only to meet all these healers, and um, but to really be able to affect people and be part of their healing journey. And they're part of our healing journey. Yeah. Well, you see, the other thing, Tova, is that we never actually talk about ourselves. Right. Right. No. Or the I mean, hives on my legs right now from babysitting my grandkids. Okay, we can talk about that. <laughs> but as hosts, we we never 
We don't talk about our own experience very much. We draw on the person who's giving us the their information and and their and their yeah. background. And remember that of all these of all these videos, there's going to be something for someone out there that resonates with them. And that's why, I mean, this was Tova's idea in the first place to do this. A really brilliant idea because we don't actually promote ourselves particularly. But what we do is we allow other people to bring it together so that there's people all around the world that people can reach out to. Right. I suppose the only the only thing is that people spend a lot of money on this stuff. And that is often quite quite traumatic. Or the they can see money. it as part of their journey. I always say you went to that doctor and that doctor and that chiropractor and that sure. doctor to get you to this place of knowing that you can heal yourself and you can utilize all that information to do it. True, Tova. But uh, many, many, many of the doctors and the um, uh, physiotherapists and that, they, they don't make the mind-body connection. So often when people co eventually come to us, right. Right. You, you know, they're at their wit's end. Very That's true. what I'm trying to Very say. True. Well, and they've spent years and years and years in therapy and what do you call it? Well, um, in, in, you in, know, in medical things. healing is possible and probable and we're seeing mm. it happen. And it's not, does not mean you're bad or weak? If you can't heal, you're on your journey. You are healing. You're, if you even come to our well, Facebook page or show up, it means you have this knowledge that there's something else going on. True. But again, the reason we're here tonight and today is to remind people that if they don't feel safe, that they need to be aware of that. Right. Right. It's not that you're not safe because you're an adult. So you are safe. But there's this belief within us that we're not. Yeah. And that's why I did that little circle thing from Circle of Security to see that if you didn't feel safe when you were younger, that segment or that whatever you call it, like feeling is still in us. And Rose, is there any, <clears throat> like for last parting words, like if somebody, can you share again how to, we have to implement, we're saying the words, <clears throat> the words, how to feel safe in your body when you know there's a threat. It's, I can tell you, <clears throat> but there's a way that you have to implement it and apply it into your life. So what could people do to feel safe? Well, the only thing they can do is remind themselves that they're an adult. That's all they have to do, really, isn't it? And they're an and, adult. and and they're adults, and they can they can handle what's going on. You're stronger yeah. than the pain. You can handle the pain. Yeah. The pain is yeah, not, but not to only, you. Okay, Tova, Tova, take it another angle. It's not that they can handle the pain because the pain is consuming. But what they can handle is the emotional conflict that they're dealing with. That's, that's beautiful. It's not about the pain. That's yes. why I, like in therapy, I don't ask about the pain, as you know. I ask about the feelings. What are your feelings about your husband? What are your feelings about your wife? What are your feelings about your kids? What are your feelings about your boss? What are your feelings about me? Recognize the emotional. Yeah. Conflict. conflict yeah yeah and and accept and accept that they don't have to do anything with it. you don't have to get rid of anything we're not beating yeah. cancer here we're really just accepting and accept yeah. it and you know like john frederickson's book the lies we tell ourselves you know we often think that you know we married the wrong person but in actual fact what we do is we're marrying we think we're married to the ideal person instead of the real person. And the real person, you know, might have smelly socks. Well, you know, I wanted to marry somebody who didn't have smelly socks, but here am I stuck with the guy with the smelly socks. That's and deep. that's what you have to stay with yeah. because this is, yeah. how, this is what I signed up for, I suppose you might say. Yeah. That's not saying that you accept yeah. violence or aggression or anything like that, but it is saying this idealization doesn't work. And, you know, if you think about love and you think about romantic relationships, people will say to me, well, you know, after four years, well, I'm sick of him. I don't like his socks anymore. 
Well, you know, it's not like that. So, yeah. It means you're sick and of you, yourself. It means maybe, maybe you're also sick of yourself. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Very good point. Very amazing. Yeah. Rose. Wise, wise words, wise, wise words. So listen, we will be back next week. We, we like Annie. We will be back next week. Don't tell me. We have scheduled guests. I think next week is Michael Galinsky. I think he's mm -hmm. coming, Michael Galinsky. Uh, we have a wonderful set of show in June. We will, um, Michael Galinsky will be here one month. We are streaming at different times. So, um, we have to so we're on us, YouTube anyway. Catch us on YouTube. If you guys have a certain like we we are we're we're uh flexible. We just have been for the last two years, Rose has been getting up at 5 a.m., 4 a.m. and I've been 4 a.m. 10, 10 p.m. And we just thought after two years we're gonna try different times. And so far it's been working out. Sometimes Rose will do a, a show alone and that's bittersweet, and then I'll do a show alone and that's bittersweet, and then twice a month we're together. <sighs> So till we meet again, I love you, Rose Hoy, down there um, with the kangaroo czar. And we'll see you Bye. next week. Bye, everybody. Thank God you. bless. Bye. Okay.